ladies and gentlemen, after two lessons of some basic issues, I would now like to give you a more broad overview on the time scale of fusion programs, on the requirements on steels, also on some irradiation issues which are closely connected to facilities. This uh, part is more in a seminar-like style, not like yesterday, but well, let's right start with the high performance material needs for energy for the next and far future. You see the timeline uh, starting from the first fission reactors. Uh, now, after two generations more, we are uh, in, in the 90s, uh, we have the current fission reactors. And um, there are plans for the so-called generation four fission reactor programs, which are much more advanced compared to the current ones. And somewhere in between fusion power and fusion power plants are also foreseen. The strategic mission of all these concepts is production of electricity, heat, but also if the processing temperatures are high enough, hydrogen production. And of course, all these plants should be compatible with environment and above all, you know, cost efficiency, that's the main uh, thing in our world and sustainability. After some uh, unforeseen events in Japan, you could say nature is striking back or something like that, the plans for the fission technology have changed tremendously, at least in the one or other countries. And especially in Germany, where I'm from, um, we have come to a full stop of all fission reactor programs, developments, and well, in Germany you won't see any fission reactor in the near future. They will all be shut down step by step. And also research, further development <coughs> of this technology will not will not, uh, not be proceeded further anymore. But there are also other countries who don't see a uh, future in these technologies. And well, that's the way it is. Safety first, that's uh, probably not a bad idea. And so this makes even more room for completely different concepts like fusion energy or at least let's try to come there. It's still a long way. I will show you in the following yeah, related issues to that. In general, there are a few uh, projects which we go further into detail. One is the International Somo Nuclear Experimental Reactor, ITER, which is currently constructed in, in the southern part of France. Um, this reactor is just for experimental issues. Then in Europe the plan is to construct a demonstration reactor within a few decades. And this reactor has the goal to demonstrate that it is really possible to generate electric power by fusion, by nuclear fusion. This might be the one and only step in between now and the uh, real fusion power plant. But, well, I can't foresee the future and probably also the politicians cannot. So timescales are quite long, you see it. It's measured not in years, but in decades. Let's wait and see. Connected to 
these plants is always or are always irradiation issues. This is one of the most uh, critical problem in all of these concepts and so we also uh, will have a brief view on current programs or plans to solve this irradiation problem. Let's first start with a quick introduction into nuclear fusion. What is it? I think you know already how it works. It's the fusion of basically hydrogen or hydrogen isotopes into helium. That's the same process as it's going on in the sun. Um, well, if it works, or, well, it's not a question <laughs> whether it works or not, it really works, this is already demonstrated, but if it works on the large scale, it would be virtually inexhaustible. So we would have an energy source for a very long time, not decades, not several hundred years, it would suffice for thousands or even million years. It is free of CO2 emissions, that's also good. And, well, there is a high energy density fuel, that's the tritium. This is fused with deuterium into hydrogen. And one gram of this uh, fully reacted deuterium tritium mixture corresponds to 10 tons of coal. So, one gram versus 10 tons of coal. I think that's impressive and this is what is always uh, advertised as the big deal in nuclear fusion. However, in nature you don't get anything for free. So, well, also here there are some drawbacks and other issues. Uh, but let's continue with the positive things. Inherently safe and controllability, that's also a point because there is a relatively low fuel inventory and since tritium is uh, radioactive, you won't lose it to the environment. But uh, in principle, if you have a tight containment and, uh, well, and also since the fuel inventory is not so high, it's inherently let's say, controllable and also relatively safe. Also, there is no chain reaction to control as we have it in fission reactors, so there is no worry that due to some mistake or whatever, things could explode. Even after a tsunami, which we face relatively rarely in Europe, but, well, one never knows, it, we are, would be on the safe side here. Low power and energy densities are also uh, the case here, so there is really no worry that at some point something melts down or temperature would, temperatures <coughs> would exceed uh, to several thousand seas or so and, and, and the whole plant would be destroyed. <coughs> That's not a worry. But as I said, there are other issues. A fusion reaction is of course difficult to start and also to maintain since it needs temperatures of uh, several million centigrades. Otherwise, the fusion reaction doesn't start. And um, it is a technically a rather complex thing. This we will see more in detail later. And uh, compared to fission reactors, this requires very, very large devices, large plants, large uh, uh, reactors, and well, if something is big, it most often costs you a lot. Um, what is, from my point of view, very well hidden in all this fusion advertisement is the real cost of the thing. Because, well, y you need only grams of the fuel, and fuel could be uh, breeded, as we will see later on, it's self-sufficient. and. Uh, um, that's clearly the positive thing, but a drawback is that all the internal parts have to be replaced. Things like blankets, diverters and so on have a lifetime of only a few years, but 
this requires a huge amount on steel and also on tungsten and other materials which uh, have to be, let's say, stored since they are radioactive after this operating time and which cannot be easily um, brought back into operation. So these are sort of consumables and um, well, on the long way this problem had to be solved. But if such issues are resolved, maybe in 10 or 100 years or whatever, fusion is really one of the most promising concepts who could bring the human race um, or provide the human race a future. Okay, here is a list of the red dots and, and red circle of fusion devices. That's uh, tokamaks, that's devices where nuclear fusion really happens. And, well, these guys like to compare it with Moore's law from uh, transistor technology where every two years the productivity and, and uh, efficiency is doubled. Um, for accelerators, that's the green dots, uh, well, there is a comparable law also for the fusion devices. But, well, you see here with recent planned devices, somehow uh, there is a strong deviation from the law. That's mainly due to the fact that, that the building of these big devices needs not years, but yeah. 10, 20, 30 years, something like that. Nevertheless, the summary of the thing is that to produce, to make uh, or to, to um, make nuclear fusion happen doesn't require much. I have been told that even a device of the size of a standard refrigerator could produce fusion. But the trick is to gain energy out of it. Up to now, we have to put much more energy in the reactor to heat it up as we take energy out of it. And the ITER project, this is the first reactor which has or will demonstrate that you can gain out energy out of nuclear fusion. This is how it looks like more or less, or that's the plan. I like this elephant here for comparison of the size. The Objective here is to produce about 500 megawatts of power in, uh, well, relatively short pulses. And uh, Q equal 10 means that you take out 10, a factor of 10 more energy than you need for heating up the whole system. The plasma volume is uh, more than 800 uh, cube meters and this will be the world's biggest fusion energy research project, or it is already. And, well, it's a worldwide project, international with many countries. So, in principle, you could say this is the product of the human race. The whole world is contributing to this thing, which uh, is impressive on the one hand, but, well, if you see how long it takes and how many problems we have to solve due to political reason and so on that's um, also impressive on the other hand. This is how it looks at the, uh, uh, presently. They have um, made place for the whole construction site. They start to build the foundations and hopefully <coughs> in a few years it will look like that. Tokamak will be somewhere hidden in this building. And the direct cost for constructions are 10 billion euros uh, within 12 years. And the foreseen operation time will be around 20 years, which means uh, a rather low cost if you consider that this is the product of the whole world, 250 million euros per year. Of course, on my private account, I would like such money, but well, compared to the world 
uh, financial situation, 250 million euros per year is not that much. 600 staff is working in this project. Uh, also a nice comparison, the whole thing weighs about 23,000 tons and this is equal three times this famous tower here, if you have been in Paris. And, well, just imagine three of this kind. This would correspond to one ITER reactor. The main components in this device is uh, the vacuum vessel, where the plasma and all the reaction is going on. Then, uh, Inside the vacuum vessel on the, uh, on the, on the wall, of the, on the inner wall of this vacuum vessel, there is the blanket. Blank in the blanket, um, the energy is trans uh, transferred from neutrons. Neutrons are uh, delivering their energy and it's transferred to thermal energy. And down at the bottom in a circle are uh, diverter cassettes one by one in a row. And these parts are responsible to remove the end product, that's helium, out of the vacuum. I have already mentioned it, that this is the thermally highest loaded part in the, um, in the whole reactor. And then outside the vacuum vessel, there are the superconducting coils, which produce the magnetic field that confines the plasma. And again, outside of that, there is a big cryostat where the temperatures and vacuum is kept low enough to um, make these superconducting coils working. And all in all, for all these components, one type of steel is used. And this is the also already mentioned. Uh, 316 steel, that's an austenitic stainless steel with a specific specification uh, with regard to impurities and certain alloying elements. That's why it's called 316 steel eater grade. Now let's see how much steel is required for eater. For the vacuum vessel, you see a picture here. The inner diameter is 6, the outer diameter 90 meter. It's a rather complex shape with all these connectors to the outside world. And um, the vacuum vessel is separated into sectors and such a sector, you see, is not really small. These are big shaped parts <coughs> and require also very specific uh, fabrication routes. And all in all, we have about 5,000 or more than 5,000 tons weight just for the vessel. Then uh, the blanket. In either the blanket is uh, not very complex. It's not used for energy conversion. It's just used to remove the energy out of the system. And um, yeah, also a modular concept, 440 single blanket boxes or modules are required. They will cover a surface of 600 square meters and the total weight is about 2,000 tons. Then the diverter. It consists, in the case of ITER, down here, of 54 single modules. A module looks like that, or here from the side view, that's uh, three meter in length and two meter in height and 70 centimeter in width. And yeah, in the end, it's uh, arranged uh, circularly. And for this, we need only 520 tons. Then the superconducting coils, that's again a more complex shaped thing. There are several different kind of coils uh, required. There are um, toroidal coils 
these are uh, the biggest part of them. I will show you here one of these coils. They are nine meter high and have a weight of 360 tons. This equals a fully loaded Boeing 747. And also here you see rather big uh, production plants are required to produce them. And well, the nice thing is that I can you show already how these things are produced. So these are not paper plants, but this is real going on. This is fabricated and that's yeah, reality. 600 uh, 6,500 tons is required just for this toroidal field coils. Then the outermost structure, that's the cryostat, and this provides the super cool vacuum environment. Um, this big vessel is subdivided into a top lid and two cylinder cylinders and the base sections. All in all, this requires 3,400 tons. So here is the overview. All these single components together have a total weight of roughly 21,000 tons. That's stainless steel. The price is approx approximately six to seven euros, uh, kilo euros per ton. And so, as of today, this would cost 130 or so million euro. Ah, and don't forget what I have said. In a real reactor, blankets have to be thrown away or stored safely after their lifetime, as well as uh, diverter cassettes. This is the materials fusion roadmap, or let us think about materials since this is our topic here. And uh, here is the timeline for the ITER project. Now we are in the construction phase. Hopefully in the early 20s it will start operation. Well, I'm not so confident, but that's another <laughs> point. Um, but again, that's mainly due to, uh, let's say, complications that uh, arise if so many different partners are working in one project. It's not necessarily, necessarily a technical problem. These are more... Um, let's say, political or uh, uh, other related problems. Not all, but, well, most of them. So, in the early 20s, it should start with first plasma and the real fusion, deuterium, tritium fusion, should then start somewhere at the 30s, or 30, exactly. And, uh, if we want to proceed further in fusion, we have to consider or start even today with the plans for the following project. That's a demonstration reactor. In a demonstration reactor, remember, we have to show that energy can really be produced uh, out of the fusion reaction. And this is where we are here today. CDA means conceptual design assessment. This is where we still have some time, or at least these are the plans, to improve material, to provide materials and all the databases for the materials which are needed for such a reactor. And this then is usually followed by an engineering design assessment phase. And then finally construction could at least these are the plans in Europe, could start somewhere in the early 30s. So with a foreseen operation in somewhere between 2040 and 50. You are young enough, so I don't worry that you might uh, observe such things. For me, well, I don't know. Um, anyway, 
only if the ETHEL project has started to produce a real deuterium tritium plasma, then we can also use ITER, and this is a planned foreseen, uh, test blankets or uh, yeah, test blanket modules, they are called in the reactor, and then we also could theoretically be able to gain more information how uh, real components are loaded. Um, there are other programs in uh, Japan and Korea, but uh, let's forget about that. I'm not so involved in all these plans, and as far as I know, up to now, they are all uh, uh, only existing on paper. So uh, for us, it is important to have a materials database available for the construction phase at the latest for a demo reactor. And uh, if you remember yesterday, what I have told you about um, defects in steel, you might wonder why ITER is fully built of only one steel, of this uh, austenitic steel. And if you remember austenitic steels, I have shown you are rather prone to swelling. But in ITER, this is not an issue, because ITER will produce so a uh, few neutrons that the, um, the dose level inside ether will be, well, only at, one, uh, at some single points about 1 to 2 dPa's in the whole lifetime of 20 years. So neutron irradiation is almost no issue in ether and that's why it can be built by available standard material like the 316 steel. But in a demo reactor, we have to produce power and lots of power. And this means the neutron irradiation will be much higher. And um, to have a start, I will also go into details later on, um, very conservatively, which means the first blanket in such a, or in the European demo reactor will only see 20 dPa, only that's a, a relative term, but as I said yesterday, 20 dPa, there we are relatively safe with 9% uh, chromium steels. A second blanket is foreseen to, uh, to be operated up to 40 dPa, which is quite at the border where helium transmutation effects come into play. But so still, the European DEMO program is a rather conservative thing. Nevertheless, we have to prove, or all you have always to prove, if you start to build and operate a nuclear facility, you have to prove that it will not break down. And so the time scale here, even it's, it's going over several decades, is rather tight, as we will see. Since the missing data in the material database is uh, almost completely due to missing data for irradiation properties, irradiation facility play an important role. We should at least in theory start even today, better we should have started 10 years ago, with an intensive irradiation test program on materials. But due to lack of uh, suitable neutron sources, um, this is one of the major problems here. Uh, there are also plans to construct and build very specific neutron sources, which would, Im um, which would mirror or simulate about the neutron environment which we would have in a fusion reactor. If we would have such a facility, we could, we could already start now to investigate the material response to the specific fusion neutron irradiation spectrum. But unfortunately, also here, we don't have this, but there are still plans. These plans have been again on paper for decades and it's shifted and shifted and shifted and 
Well, I will also show you at least a few figures or pictures at the end of this lecture regarding this specific irradiation facilities. Now, where are the material challenges? We are not only living into, uh, in, in a fusion-related world, there is nevertheless lots of fission investigations going on worldwide and also so-called spallation sources, neutron sources. And let's have a look on a few of these, these projects. The requirements for the in-vessel components in fission reactor at the beginning have been very low. Temperatures have been below 300 C. And DPA in the first generation fission reactors have also been quite low at, at around 1 DPA or so. Helium transmutation was negligible with 0.1 APPM helium. You can forget it. It's not enough to form helium bubbles. And the particle energies, okay, if you're interested in there in the single MeV range. Let's skip our generation two and three reactors as, uh, as we have today working. Fission plants for new generation, which are even more effective <coughs> and producing much less waste, are in coming in a variety of plants. There are at least five different concepts. So the temperature are also varying in the broad range. There are very high temperature reactor plants, which well, want to go up to 1000 C, but the lowest temperature here is 500 C. The doses, however, are quite high, 30 to 150 dPa, and that's an immense neutron dose or displacement damage dose. And, but also helium transmutation in these fission reactors could almost be neglected. I have uh, uh, shown you yesterday 3 to 10 APPM helium, that's, well, that's something, but not so problematic. And particle energies are in the same range as they have ever been in fission in the single MeV range. Now, for fusion, let's say more for a prototype reactor or real fusion power plant, temperatures start at around 500 C and well, the higher the better. Also here, there are plans that we should have or face uh, temperatures in the structure, in some parts of structural materials up to 1000 C. But in any case, the neutron dose will be high, at least 150 dPa's. And that's not for DEMO, as I have shown you before, for a European project. That's really for a power plant, which we will have in 100 years or so. Helium transmutation is even worse. In general, in fusion, nuclear fusion, the ratio between helium damage and uh, DPA, uh, neutron damage and uh, helium production is a factor of 10. For each DPA, you produce 10 APPM helium. And this means after 100 dPa, you had 1,000 APPM helium, or what we have to deal with finally, 150 or even more dPa would produce 1,500 APPM helium. And yesterday we have seen that the limit where the material really degradates is around 500 APPM helium. So you already see here one of the biggest long-term problem in fusion power. I would like to skip uh, spallation installations. These are special, special accelerators where neutrons are produced to further burn down existing or used fuel elements from fission reactors in order to minimize the amount of waste. Now, the European fusion community has performed a study, a so-called Power Plant Conceptual Study, PPCS, and they 
well, that's several years old. They have come up with five different models. We don't have to go into the details here. In principle, the main differences are in the blanket in terms of coolant. There is a water-cooled concept and this would operate at temperature ranges comparable to pressurized water fission reactors, meaning inlet temperatures of 280-285 degrees C and outlet temperatures 300 and 325 C. If you remember also yesterday, exactly at this range around 300 C, this was the temperature range where this 9% chromium steels faced the highest hardening and embrittlement. So why on earth does somebody come up with such a uh, concept? I don't know why, but well, it escapes me. Still, it was uh, Model A to use water-cooled blankets. We will come to that later on. Then uh, helium, this is uh, used in three concepts and up to now this is also a, a one of the favorite, at least in, in, in Karlsruhe and at CEA and I think in, in, in most places in Europe this is favored at the moment. And um, here the beneficial thing is that you could rise temperatures up to 500 C and uh, this would mean that the steel is operated in the safe region where no hardening or at least only a small amount of hardening and embrittlement occurs. Then there are some rather ambitious models which uh, would like to have um, liquid metal cooling but you know high magnetic fields which we of course have in a the magnetic confined tokamak and liquid metal leads to um, so-called magnetohydrostatic effects due to uh, eddy currents and so on. So that's not the very best thing to have. At least you need an electric insulated pipe systems where the liquid metal flows and so you could not use steel or any metal for uh, structural materials. So in this case this would require silicon carbides as a structural material and well unfortunately in silicon carbides the transmutation rate for helium is another order of magnitude higher and this would finally end up in 10,000 APPM helium. So, well, I cannot imagine how this would work or could work, but still there are some plans which uh, might or might not deal with this problem. So let's focus on helium and probably water-cooled solutions for the blanket. In uh, the diverter, it's relatively easy. There is a water-cooled concept like in ether th that is based on a copper alloy, copper chrome zirc, zirconium alloy. And within a certain area, not exactly this was what, what, what is written here in this concept, today we know more about it, but let's say in the range of 200 to, to 300 centigrades, um, this material could be safely operated. For all other diverter concepts, helium cooling is foreseen and in the seminar I have already shown you the problems connected to tungsten. They are also immense because tungsten is so brittle and even without irradiation. So I would say in general the diverter area is one of the biggest problems uh, if we are talking about future nuclear fusion programs. This is a typical overview of the materials we have at hand. It is clear that polymers are not usable in uh, nuclear fusion. Also uh, all kind of plastics, be it elastomers or whatever. The green area, these are metal alloys and specifically here this darker green area, this is what can be covered by steels. You see here 
strengths in terms of creep strengths for uh, or even tensile strengths, it doesn't matter. You need in general much more than 100 MPa for structural applications and here we have temperature. So what we would or have to cover is uh, for the blankets, well at least temperatures around 3 to 400 C to avoid hardening but also as high as possible to increase the efficiency, efficiency of the power conversion. So in general steels are more or less the only materials we have available here because ceramics this would be the only other options where you could cover higher temperatures are uh, very problematic to use as a structural uh, cooling system. Also they face severe degradation under neutron irradiation. What we have common in generation 4 and fusion reactors uh, is shown here but let's, let's first have a look on the ITER requirements this starts here, down there on the left hand side, which means DPA or displacement damage almost zero or only one, two, maximum three DPA. And also the temper temperature range is uh, typical for water cooling, two to three hundred centigrades. That's not so dramatic. You can, uh, well, I'm sure we can easily handle that. Current operating fission reactors are in this area. Also, I have, uh, um, well, th most often they are pressurized water reactors, so they end up around at uh, 300 something centigrades. Or, uh, well, in some cases they are liquid metal cooled and the temperature range is higher. These are the five plans for generation four reactors, which we don't have to go into detail here. And some of them overlap with the fusion power plant requirement. As said, this would require 150 to 200 dPa's in a fusion power plant and temperatures starting from 400 C <coughs> as high as possible. As high as possible means we can cover at the moment with ferritic martensitic steels which could be produced on the large scale temperatures up to about 550 C. There are plans to increase this temperature also with steels but then somewhere between 6 and 700 centigrades there is a natural end where steels can be used. Then the only possibilities would be uh, very sophisticated steels, ODS steels, I will also briefly come back to that, or vanadium alloys and well above that only silicon carbide would be an option but you see the higher the temperature the less hope for real application uh, at least for me is there. Now let's compare the ferritic martensitic steels, that's the often mentioned 9% chromium steels and the austenitic stainless steels. And the major reason why we have to, or well, why engineers in general want to use rather ferritic martensitic steels than austenitic steels are two basic <coughs> properties. That's the thermal conductivity, 9% chromium steels, that's this line are quite better thermal conductors compared to um, stainless steels, austenitic <coughs> stainless steels. That's one point and in energy applications you, you, you need a good thermal conductivity in order to keep your temperatures low in the structure. Also the thermal expansion has um, effect on the design. You don't want to have your structures expand with rising temperatures and you see austenitic stainless steels have a much higher thermal expansion coefficient to compared to 9% chromium steels. So even if you don't 
look on neutron irradiation damage, basic properties of these materials uh, favor 9% chromium steels. Then uh, by now you know all about the new neutron irradiation and materials degradation. These are in principle the four points we have al uh, always have to be kept in mind. That's the hardening, the irradiation creep, the volumetric swelling in materials, and the helium embrittlement. All has specific ranges of temperatures and also DPAs, but for future fusion power plants, uh, the helium embrittlement is probably the severest one. Another reason we have seen already yesterday why um, 316 steels should not be used for higher irradiation doses is the swelling. And uh, <coughs> also from yesterday, you see that the green line, that's the ferritic man sitting seal, steels, uh, don't show such high swelling rates. So in principle, even at 150 dPa and higher, the swelling would be within, a, within an acceptable range. And that's why for all further fusion concepts beyond either, these 9% chromium steels are, let's say, the backbone. Also in fusion um, energy systems, we don't want to have this long living waste like uh, fission of uranium is producing. So you can screen the table of elements and uh, assess which element easily transmutes into long living isotopes. And if you do this and exclude also inherently unsafe or unhealthful material, you end up again in three classes of materials. That's silicon carbide. This doesn't produce long living isotopes. Or vanadium alloys. They consist mainly of vanadium, but with additions of chromium, titanium, and probably a bit of silicon. This is also low level uh, or low activating uh, materials or steels, but with steels you are restricted to these elements. So whatever you do, a steel more or less has to consist of iron, chromium, can contain some amount of tungsten, vanadium and well, let's say at, at less as possible tantalum also. In this case, you end up in materials, and you see it here, there are several steels um, as they cool down after activation. Here we have the years in uh, one year, 10 year, 100 year, 1000 year, 10,000 and so on. And um, high level waste, that's um, waste which has stored or handled like uh, fuel elements from f fission reactors. There is a medium level waste which uh, doesn't help much, but low level waste, this is the goal where we want to be. Low level waste handling is relatively easy and of course the best you could reach or want to reach is the hands-on level. Hands-on level means the material is so low active that you could handle it literally by hand. Now the classical 12 or I don't know, I think yeah, 10 to 11 percent steel which was also used for um, energy systems and if you would use such a conventional steel, you see it cools down rather quickly after 100 years, but then there is a long living tail in degradation of this activation. And okay, after a few 100,000 years, you could handle this material again. But well, for me personally, this is too long, for you probably too. So the Eurofair, that's the Fusion 9% chromium version, which uh, was specifically fabricate, fabricated 
and avoided all these long living elements. Here you see it in the green line after okay, one to 200 years, it is at least low level waste. So it could be easily stored, it's not a high risk. <coughs> However, hence on level, even with this deal, is reached only after 100,000 years. That's a, a fact. There are still possibilities to further reduce the impurities and uh, you see it here on a, um, a Japanese 8% chromium steel. Um, the hands-on level is reached already after 10,000 years, which is still a long time. But in theory, if you could really produce a pure material, which of course you can never do, but in theory, a real pure steel would uh, reach the hands-on level after 200 years. So this is one of the technical issues to purify steels and produce them in huge amounts. The main components, that's always blanket and diverters, need a plasma armor shield at a, a plasma facing area. Um, for this we have to use tungsten or a tungsten alloy. Then the main parts of the blanket boxes can or will be built by this Eurofair reduced or low activation ferritic martensitic steel and we have seen that it could be operated safely in the temperature range of 350 to 550 C. Then uh, we also need functional materials in these blankets. These are mainly two different kinds of materials. Beryllium is needed in a huge amount to multiply neutrons. That's a specific uh, property of beryllium. One neutron comes in and then it multiplies neutrons and we need a huge amount of lower energetic neutrons in order to transmute lithium. That's probably uh, what you can consider as a fuel production material in a fusion reactor. This transmutes lithium into tritium and tritium is needed and since tritium cannot be found in nature and collected there, you have to produce it. You have to produce tritium artificially and since tritium is the fuel for fusion react reactions, this is the second main uh, issue of blanket. That's why they are called breeding blanket. They have to um, transform the energy but also they have to transmute or to breed tritium for uh, keeping the reaction diffusion reaction going on. I will skip the diverter because that's not interesting here. And with this background let's now consider the demonstration reactor. Remember that's the one after the ether reactor but as said we have already to make plans and investigations today in order to being able to have this thing working in the 30s. In Europe this demonstration reactor or demonstration power plant has three goals. One is really to produce net electricity for the grid in the order of a few hundred uh, MeVs. So this is the big difference. It also has to demonstrate that there is a closed fuel cycle to produce tritium. That's the breeding capability I have just mentioned. And the third point is to demonstrate all the technologies for the construction then in the 50s, 60s or 70s of a real power plant which can then produce for a long time and safely energy out of fusion reaction. This is the goal and the plan for the DEMO reactor. There are two strategies. One is a rather conservative one, which means 
to avoid all techni technological and material problems, the operating time is reduced so much and the plant increased as large as possible to have the neutron flux as low as possible. That is the damage in the materials to keep them as low as possible. It is still an open question whether water cooling makes sense or not. This is a, again more or less a political question, but from our, from the material scientist's point of view, you know 300 C hardens and embrittles steel, that's the one problem. And um, well, nevertheless, you could reduce the operating time of the blankets that the, this is still in a safe area, but you could always also make use of the annealing capability of materials. Remember, if you heat up damaged materials, there is a recombination, recovery of the material properties. So maybe you could heat up the whole reactor to 500 C for a short time or 600 C, I don't know. Then uh, the material is restored at least in the one way or other. So water cooling for the early demo, for a, a conservative demo, could still make sense. However, if you want a demo to for C or to see as a step to a real power plant, then I think it is clear for a real power plant you can't live with these low temperatures. And so again, we are back to uh, research policy. What is better? What makes more or less sense? In any way, sooner or later, helium cooled or gas cooled or however cooled, but operating on a higher temperature, these are the concepts which reach much, much more into the future. In any case, as mentioned, the Eurofair steel will be the backbone of such reactors and will be used for the main components. Let's see how much of these steels are needed. So for a demo reactor, blanket has to be uh, produced by Eurofair or such a 9 chromium steel, the need is in the range of 2,000 tons and for the diverter, uh, at least for the body of the diverter cassettes, it's in the range of 1,000 tons. As said, Eurofair uh, will do the deed here. I will also come to this later. And of course, you cannot just say, okay, here is a material, I will build components with this material. If you do this for a nuclear plant or a nuclear uh, um, power reactor or whatever, you have to demonstrate it by qualification and codes and standards that this material will really comply to your plans. In the case of Eurofair, it is already part of a French code, French nuclear code for uh, such plants, the RCC MRX code. And uh, you might think that <coughs> compared to either a demo or a power plant would consist then mainly of this 9% chromium steel. But this is not the case, you see it here. You still need steel for the vacuum vessel, for superconducting coils, for cryostats. And since these components are shielded from the neutrons, they don't require such uh, expensive Eurofair steels. They still can be built up from austenitic stainless steels. However, the requirements in terms of tons is higher compared to either, so we need, would need for the vacuum vessel more than 10,000 tons, for the coils about 30,000 tons, and for the cryostat more than 15,000 tons. So, um, well, I would buy some stocks on austenitic steels if these plants ever come to reality. Then finally, 
The final difference to the ITER reactor is that you have to produce power, so you also need a relatively small amount, but still you need some steel for the generators, for turbines, for steam uh, uh, generators, heat exchangers, and so on. And this is the overview. About 10, 40, 45, 50,000 tons of um, austenitic steel will be required for such a demo plant and only in the range of 3,000 tons of Eurofair. So, in principle, it's not such a hopeless situation since um, yeah, the amount of Eurofair of this 9 chromium steel is not as high, at least compared to the austenitic steel requirements. Industrial companies in the order of several 10 tons, it's available and well, we don't have to consider this. So, regarding the material, there is already a basic idea of how to proceed. Now let's have a look on the components. As I said, the breeding blankets, um, they look like boxes, U-shaped with a grid inside and you can push here in also in a modular way breeding units. Such breeding units are filled with beryllium uh, pebbles to multiply the neutrons and they are also filled with lithium or lithium ceramics. This produces the tritium and the production of tritium will be purged out by a flow of helium. But at the same time, in the, in the whole volume of the box, we have energy conversion. Neutron produce thermal energy and you have to remove this thermal energy. And this, as a consequence, requires that all plates you see here, all the grids, all single plates, are not solid. They have tiny cooling channels inside, so they look rather complex if you have a closer look on them. These are not just steel plates which you can roll down, they have a delicate internal cooling structure. And um, yeah, you can already imagine from this figure that many, many weld fabrication issues are uh, connected to the fabrication of these uh, blanket boxes. The required amount of these neutron multipliers is in the range of uh, 320 tons in a demo reactor. In a single test blanket module, which could be tested if either is operating, we need already 400 kilograms and maybe you know beryllium is not a material which is, um, well, which you would consider as cheap. It, um, yeah, it also is limited. But, well, maybe there are solutions to um, use all these uh, beryllium pebbles at least for a longer time. Then the lithium ceramic, this will be destroyed during operate, op operation, that, that's clear because lithium is transmuted into tritium. That's the goal of the whole story. 90 kilogram, that's not so much, is used, uh, is used for one test blanket module in either. And for a demo reactor we would require 72 tons in total. I don't know how much lithium is in, uh, you know, these uh, battery packs in, in, in your laptop, but, well, it seems 70 tons or so, that's not such a big deal. Again, here is a closer look on these breeding units, and you already see it, or you, you see it here on this uh, photograph that, indeed, there is a lot of technological advances and, and also uh, success and studies. These things are really produced today and, well, from these few details you see here, that 
welding is one of the main fabrication and production issues. That's why later on we will have a separate uh, lecture only on welding. The problems on the longer term I have already mentioned. It's helium transmutation. So uh, current prominent investigative um, story is how can we produce the right amount that is 10 APPM helium per DPA in existing irradiation facilities. Um, to do that we have used Eurofair steel and mixed a specific amount of boron into the steel and then irradiated the steel in a usual uh, experimental test reactor which would produce only a very low amount of helium but then due to transmutation of boron and since boron directly or more or less directly transmutes into helium this is an artificial way to increase the amount of helium during irradiation. This has been done. I have shown you these figures already. And with increasing helium amount, as you see here, there is ongoing hardening, uh, loss of ductility, and finally in the range of 1000 APPM helium, uh, the steel is completely brittle and totally useless. And, well, now there are two possibilities. One say, by doing this artificial helium production, this is an overestimation of reality, since in a real neutron spectrum in a fusion device, the helium distribution is more uniform and doesn't lead to such severe bubble formation. But, well, nobody knows since we cannot irradiate material exactly with the um, environment in a fusion reactor. For that we would need a fusion reactor, but in order to build a fusion reactor we first need to have the data. So, uh, well, what can you do? What has been done that boron doping, another issue would be you use a uh, a very, very expensive um, isotope that's iron 54 isotope. Uh, so, <coughs> so far, nobody could afford this test in a huge amount. So, what we have are really and only these results without helium transmutation and with helium transmutation artificially mixed or irradiated in a reactor. From this at least we have um, maybe overestimated and therefore very, very conservative estimates on, on the helium effect. And well, from what we may, uh, know today, the limits at are at or around 500 APPM helium. Then um, in tensile tests, they have assessed this transmutation from neutron boron 10 isotope into helium and lithium and uh, some energy. And you see here indeed as a remainder from this formerly boron precipitate a mix of this end product helium and lithium. And well, this obviously is not a fine distributed defect and, well, these are the before mentioned reasons why many say this is an overestimation. But, well, what we would need to more to determine this in a more precise way would be a neutron spectra exactly like this blue curve. This is how a demonstration reactor first wall would uh, see neutrons. And you see there is a sharp peak at 40 MeV and the spectrum is cut for 
higher energies. Well, again, such a spectrum can only be generated in a real fusion reactor and um, for comparison with artificial neutron sources, which could be tailor suited to mirror image or to, to, to simulate such a spectrum, this uh, light blue curves uh, is the best we could produce today. So the similarities are striking and uh, with, su with such a spectrum and such a device, well, we could really investigate the effects and predict what would happen in a real fusion reactor. For comparison, if you do this with fission reactors, then uh, the results in tensile curves look like that, because almost uh, no helium is produced here. If you compare this with this spallation sources, that's the artificial neutron sources, then there is again a tremendous overestimation because here the production rate of helium is much, much higher than uh, in a fission reactor and also higher by a order of magnitude at least compared to a fusion reactor. So that's the general problem. We need irradiation data, but we cannot produce it in the way a real fusion reactor would produce neutrons. Here, this is the fission data from experimental test reactor without helium production. This is a simulation in fission reactor um, irradiation by boron doping or also by spallation source, the artificial neutron sources or ion beams. And what we would need is fusion neutrons where we would cover this range here. Since today we cannot do this, as said, the concept of an early demonstration reactor is to restrict ourselves to this limit where we can be relatively sure that nothing happens. So, again, this doesn't solve the final goal of fusion energy for everybody and for a long time in future but the first step for a demonstration reactor could at least partly be covered. One other broad field of investigation and research is to produce specific steels that could finally sustain this high helium production rate and there is only one measure you can do this. Uh, we have seen this also yesterday. If you produce very, very fine and very many precipitates or sinks, recombination sources in the material. This is the only way of how to deal with this helium problem. And that's why ODS steels are in the focus of today's fusion materials investigations. I could spend hours alone on this topic. There are thousands of publications already. In principle, you see it here, fine dispersed oxides uh, are um, produced on a powder metallurgic way in these <coughs> steels. And the result is that helium or any gas bubbles are uh, trapped to these fine precipitates. They will not be able to grow to produce this um, fracture behavior at grain boundaries. and well, at the moment it looks like that this is the only way for the far future to overcome the problem. Another beneficial uh, thing of this ODS deals is that um, what we have seen, the loss of strain hardening that the usual 9% chromium steels after some irradiation time uh, they embrittle, they got harder, they suffer from irradiation hardening, that's one point, but they lose their cold working part, their plastic stability over a broad range of strain. If you would load them above this limit, then we would have a plastic collapse of all um, components you would build with this material. 
Of course, you can uh, restrict the stresses to certain limits and this will not happen. But still, this is not exactly the way you want your material to look like after irradiation. If you compare this to ODS steels, you see they are also suffering from hardening, but sti they, they still have their work hardening capability. And, well, these are two ways where these ODS steels behave better. There has been uh, much progress. I have only plotted what we have been in, in a very small program at KIT over the uh, last five years, but worldwide they have been much more successful and, uh, well, I, I would say the way of how to produce these ODS deals is more or less covered. That's no problem anymore. There is uh, only one remaining problem. You can produce these materials, they are perfect, they are good, but the amount you can produce is in the kilogram range. So, for a fully demonstration reactor or power plant, this is uh, far too low. At the moment, the price for a kilogram of such a material is uh, one or even several thousand euro per kilogram. And you have seen we need for uh, blanket modules or things like that uh, thousands of tons. So we are talking about billions of euros only for this steel. So yeah, I don't know how I can be more uh, uh, precise, but I would consider it a problem. And uh, yeah, we are working on this problem. There is as always, you could think of a deal. Maybe you could produce this material not as perfectly as we can it do now on, on the lab scale, but uh, well, but still perfect enough, however, on a larger scale. And well, if we can save or find fabrication okay. routes which are more effective or promising, then uh, such deals might come into play sooner or later, but again, this is one of the striking problems uh, in the materials. Also, the missing gaps in the materials database. I also don't want to go through all the details. If you have time, you can <coughs> have a closer look on the single issues. In general, green is what we know for sure. Yellow are points we know partly, and the red dots are things we don't know yet. But we have to fill the whole matrix with green dots. So for in order to make DEMO working, or at least the engineering uh, assessment phase starting, we need much more green dots here. And most of the red dots, or uh, let's say all of the red dots are related to irradiation. Then you might think that developing a, a new material is uh, exciting, which you are right, it is. And if you have produced in your lab a beautiful material, you could go to industry and say, okay, here is my material, let's start building something with that. But it doesn't work that way. There are technical readiness levels for materials and that's kind of a rating system of how major your material is for industrial application. This includes the whole fabrication, root and characterization. That's always the first step. Even here you might think, okay, let's produce a few tensile specimens, choppy specimens, whatever, test them. We are through with it in a month and then, well, we have a database. No, that's not the case. You really have to do it on a large scale, on different labs. It has been certified tests and so on and so on. And this is only one step to increase your readiness level, let's say from zero, which starts in your lab, to readiness level one and maybe two. Then there are short-term responses to the operating environment. So you have to prove that the coolant 
and the interaction with coolant and your material is not a problem. In our case, tritium transport in the material is an issue since tritium is uh, uh, radioactive. You have to clear the responses to the fully, integ fully integrated environment. All these things and, well, you can imagine this takes time. This is uh, uh, quite an effort. If you have done this, this increases your readiness levels again a few steps, one or two. Then you have to demonstrate technology, the long-term behavior of components. This includes the characterization of radiation damage. You have seen how problematic this alone is. Then uh, the radiation damage on components, which then includes also welds or other joints, whatever you use in your component. Uh, you have to demonstrate the component reliability, failure modes, failure rates, things like that, and all with respect to your material. If you have done this, your readiness level increases to seven or so. And then there is still the licensing part. Your material has to be um, finalized, let's say, and uh, code qualified Standard rules for the design have to be established and uh, all related in addition to fabrication technologies, joining or even uh, grinding or whatever come, comes into play here. And only then you reach the final technical re readiness level where you can use your material in a nuclear plant. This usually or, well, let's say in the case of Eurofair, we, we are somewhere here also with still a lot of gaps in the database, you have seen. And for Eurofair, we are now between 20 and 30 years of development time. So, well, the timescales in materials development, or at least in steel, are not as short as you might imagine. Some of these readiness levels have been estimated for steels. As I said, for this reduced activation steels, we are, yeah, well, by now, I, I would say even somewhere there. But all these ODS steels, then tungsten alloys I have shown you yesterday, silicon carbide, beryllium, whatever materials are used and needed in fusion plants, are still somewhere at the beginning or in the middle of these technical readiness levels. Uh, well, okay, you might also think that it's just a question of putting money in there or human resources, but that's not the case. Even if we would spend a few hundred million and, and well, increase the stuff by a order of magnitude, this would not solve the problem because as I have said, we have no opportunity to irradiate the material to get the data. So irradiation sources, that's the real problem. Now in Europe, the uh, program towards a demo reactor is uh, yeah, right at the moment changing. Formerly it was the uh, EFTA association, now a new construct is coming up, it's called Eurofusion, and this is now more technological oriented. That's not a um, scientific program anymore, it's a technological program which is really focused on the construction of a demo reactor in the, let's say, in the 30s, 2030s. Here materials for the first time uh, are one of the biggest pro projects together with breathing blankets and well I, I have the I don't know whether it's a pleasure or, but I have it I'm heading this um, undergoing this project and it's now focused on three different kind of materials that's exactly these steels we need Eurofair steels with a possible um, 
application for water cooling, but also with possible improvement of the high temperature applicabilities and with a side issue concerning the ODS deals where we really focus on the production on the large scale, not in kilograms, but let's say in the next five years, 100 kilograms towards tons. Then high heat flex materials, that's uh, in, in any case an important issue for the diverter and uh, also new are functional materials that's more or less dielectrics and um, optical ceramics. All this as in the past is uh, accompanied by hopefully irradiation campaigns that's as you have seen is still a problem which we have to solve but also a strong uh, connection to the modeling because this uh, atomistic and, and uh, large-scale modeling is the only way where you could maybe benefit and uh, add additional information for these gaps in the irradiation database. I think we do the rest rather quickly. These are possible irradiation facilities, one which we have at hand today, this is just a list. We, in, in Europe, we have only two material test reactor. One is in Belgium, which produces a very low DPA rate per year. It's a, let's say, one DPA per year at best. So we would wait, uh, we would have to wait 20 years in order to get the first results for a, for a very easy breeding blanket. So this reactor, I would say, is not uh, very useful for uh, steel irradiations. Then there is one other in, in the Netherlands still up uh, operational for, uh, for a few years. Here you could theoretically produce, um, yeah, let's say, up to seven DPA in the best case per year. But we will never get this high flux positions. So also here it's rather doubtful since it's only working for, uh, I, I don't know, still two or three years, then it's shut down. So also here we don't reach required doses. This leaves another reactor at the United States, uh, States where um, at least for screening or for uh, some intermediate experiments we would have intermediate dose ranges and well the situation with Russia at the moment you know is a bit troublesome so I don't know what the political issue is here in principle they, they have some reactors but there are uh, other restrictions Japan they had reactors running but after Fukushima they are shut down so this is the worldwide situation more or less it's uh, yeah not so encouraging that's why accelerator driven neutron sources are considered one I have already mentioned this is a uh, more or less to uh, um, fission program where Cladding elements can be reduced under irradiation. This is under planning, so I don't know how many decades that will take. But then <coughs> another European or a French test reactor is under construction now, and you see the time scale um, changes from time to time. I think this light was produced a year or two years ago, and then they still had hopes that in 2015 director comes up but as far as I know uh, it will take <laughs> longer. 2015 would be next year I guess it still needs three years or so but they are not very specific. Again this is just under construction and in planning then uh, these artificial neutron sources have been on the table or on paper for a long time this is also a billion dollar project and, and the issue is just for, for the whole thing 
to produce irradiation damage as we uh, need it for fusion. That's why it's not so prominent. In principle, an iron source produces protons or ions. These are accelerated rather high to 40 MeV, and then they meet a liquid target of lithium. It's a liquid flowing curtain, let's say. There, this particle mean, meets, and then they produce behind that uh, curtain um, neutron, neutrons, and they could then be used to irradiate materials. There has been uh, some investigation started already. Some modules have been built, but the, oops, but there are no. Ah, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> A notice from Microsoft. I'm sorry, we had to close your program. Do you want to give us information? No, I don't want. Yeah, here we have been. So uh, this is also a political question. If somebody has one or a few billion euros available, please spend it there. Then we will get a spallation source. As a conclusion from this talk, well, there would be many, but very precisely, I hope I have demonstrated that the irradiation data problem, the missing data problem, the gaps in the database, that's one of the severest problems in fusion, uh, in fusion. And well, in principle, it's a worldwide activity. And also, in principle, I guess to, well, that's a bit philosophical. But um, if the human race wants to live as we are living now, or even better, and not like in the Stone Age. We probably don't need to fly to the moon, but, well, we need energy. There is no way out. With uh, decreasing resources everywhere, energy is the only hope. If at all, then fusion energy might solve this. At the moment, we, we are all probably a bit skeptical, because there are lots of details. But from my point of view, to investigate here would make sense, because if there is the one or other Albert Einstein who solves the one or other striking problem in this field, this might also be, uh, also be plasma physics, then uh, the human race could easily survive another 1,000 years. Of course, the human race has other drawbacks. If, uh, politics and all the other things work out, that's uh, uh, the, the basis of all. But, well, in general, there is a long way for high temperature materials to go. And as I said, since I'm already an old man, I don't uh, hope to proceed far on that road. But for you, there might be a real interesting future in it. I think with this we can end. Thank you. As always, yes, questions. <laughs> hey, thank, you, sir. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much for the lecture. It was very interesting. Uh, I, am, I have a very uh, basic question. Uh, it's just, as far as I understand, in the deuterium tritium reaction, most of the energy is carried by the neutrons. Yes. So, uh, so what, what, I, what is the energy we're going to collect in order to produce the electricity? Like only the energy which is carried by the helium ashes? Or... Uh, I, I'm not sure whether I understood you correctly. So 80 80% 80 of the nuclear fusion reaction uh, is going into neutrons. 20% is going into the accelerated helium. Yeah. atoms or uh, a so cause. It's, and it's only this 20% the mm -hmm. energy which is going to be used to the produce the electricity. No. The 80% from the neutron, this is the energy source. 
the neutron meets the metal, interacts with the metal and produces thermal energy. The whole blanket boxes are heated up. If you would not cool the blanket boxes, they would melt due, due to the high neutron load. So that's how you take the, the, the energy, the thermal energy? Yes. Okay. And well, with water cooling it's easy. Water comes in with 200 C, goes out with 300 C. That's the usual water cooling circle. With helium, it's uh, on a higher level. Inlet temperature would be, let's say, 400 C, and the helium would uh, heat it up to 500 C. And then in a second step, the energy had to be, well, uh, um, exchanged with a water or a steam generating uh, uh, um, circle. And well, at the end there is the turbine. But in general, 80% will be produced in the blankets and from that, uh, well, the energy is all coming from the neutrons. In the diverter, we meet 20% of the fusion energy by this incidenting helium particles mostly. And well, if we find a solution for the diverter at all, you could also gain, yeah, at least 20% out of the uh, fusion energy. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. Welcome. So for silicon carbide, what would you say is the main challenge and where do we need to do research there? Well, the main challenge is to find a proper application <laughs> as with the diverter. I think at the moment uh, the main challenge in silicon carbide is its severe degradation in thermal conductivity. The thermal conductivity of silicon carbide is n not the highest. It's, uh, well, comparable to steel or something like that in the same order of magnitude, but after irradiation it comes down severely. Uh, or at least after irradiation, the, the thermal conductivity is only, uh, well, I do not remember exactly, but uh, significant lo significantly lower as before. That's one problem. Uh, the other problem is helium transmutation by, well, even the order of magnitude higher compared to steel. I don't know whether this is an issue. There are controversial discussion. One say, uh, helium formation is not the same problem in silicon carbide compared to steel, but well, I'm not believing any discussion without having an experiment. So, well, but other, well, I, I, I could mention several other problems. Price, for example, production. If I have mentioned the price for ODS deals, uh, well, with silicon carbides at the moment, I think it, it's almost as expensive, if, if not more. And, yeah, well. I would have expected one question from you also yesterday, but at the latest today. And this question would be, why do you use 9% chromium steel and not 10 or 8 or 7 or 5 or 14? Why is it 9? You always hear 9%. I forgot to show you the answer, or maybe it was by intention, I don't know. If you may, there are experiments, they have tested uh, chromium contents on steel and the impact of irradiation and exactly at 9% there is a minimum in, in, in swelling, in hardening with regards to every uh, um, irradiation degradation. So that's the simple answer. 9% is the minimum with, uh, for irradiation degradation. That's the reason. And another question from your side would be, uh, can we have a coffee now? <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs>